So last time we talked about systems of equations, and we looked at a couple different methods of solving a system of equations, but all the systems that we looked at just had two equations involving two variables. But sometimes situations come up where you have to deal with three equations at a time, or four, or even dozens of equations involving dozens of variables. So today we're going to look at how you can solve a system of equations no matter how many equations or how many variables it involves. The method we're going to talk about here, the basic approach is the same, no matter how many equations and how many variables are involved. So this method is going to involve matrices. Now to start out with, here is an example that I found in the book of a problem where to solve the problem, you do need to solve a system of three equations involving three unknowns. I'm not going to go over this in detail because I don't want to spend too much time working on the exact problem, but in this problem there are three unknowns. Well, it talks about a natural history museum borrowed two million dollars at simple and annual interest, and some of the money was borrowed at seven percent, some at eight point five percent, and some at nine point five percent. So we need to find out how much of it was borrowed at each of those three interest rates. So there are three unknowns here. And what we know about them is that those three amounts add up to $2 million. And that the total annual interest was $169,750. So 7% of X plus 8.5% of Y plus 9.5% of Z should add up to 169,750. And they also tell us that the amount borrowed at 8.5% was four times the amount borrowed at 9.5%. So that would be Y equals four times Z. Or you could rearrange that to say y minus 4z equals 0. So that gives us three equations involving three unknowns. And to answer the question, we have to figure out what numbers go in for x, y, and z to make all three of those equations true. Now, one way to approach this would be to say, okay, if y equals 4z, we can stick in 4z in place of y into these other two equations and reduce it to a system of two equations involving just the two variables x and z and take it from there using one of the approaches we talked about in chapter six. But that isn't always real easy to do. Sometimes all three equations involve all three of the variables. Sometimes we have more than three equations involving more than three variables. So the method we're going to see in this chapter works the same way no matter how many equations and how many variables you have, as long as they are all linear equations, as long as they don't involve any of the variables squared or multiplied together or anything like that. So to set us up for the way the method works, let me remind you or point out that when you have a system of equations, when you have a system of equations, there are some things that you can do that won't change the solution. You can write the equations in a different order. So if I wrote these same three equations, but I put this one on top and this one on the bottom, it would really be the same system and it would have the same solution. You can multiply both sides of an equation by a non-zero constant. We were doing that when we did the elimination method where we multiplied everything on both sides by the same number, as long as that number isn't zero, which would just kill everything off. And we know we're allowed to add two equations together. Or actually, we can add a multiple of one equation to another equation. Like we could add 
negative 2 times one equation to another equation, something like that. So keep this in mind. We're going to come back to this in a couple minutes. The key to this method that we're going to learn about today is taking a system of equations and turning it into a matrix and then working with that matrix. So a matrix is basically a box with numbers in it. It's a rectangular array of numbers. Like this one right here, four, three, seven, one, two, three. That's an example of a matrix that has two rows and three columns. So it, we would call it a two by three matrix. This particular matrix takes the numbers from the system of equations that you see over here on the left. 4x plus 3y equals 7 and x plus 2y equals 3. So if you take just the numbers involved, leave out the variables and the plus signs and the equal signs, and just put the numbers into a rectangular array, those numbers are 4, 3, and 7 for the first equation, and then 1, 2, and 3 for the second equation. So the numbers in the first column here are the coefficients on the x terms. The numbers in the second column are the coefficients on the y terms. And the numbers in the third column are the constant terms that are over on the other side of the equal sign. And together, they make up what's called the augmented matrix for the system. And the way I've got it written, I've got a line here separating the two sides of the equations. You don't have to put that in, but it helps us to keep track of where the equal signs are in the equations. So let's try doing that. Let's take the system of equations that we were looking at earlier here. Notice they're all set up the same way with the x term and the y term and the z term on one side equal to just a number on the other side. And let's write the augmented matrix for that system. So each individual equation is going to give us one row of the matrix. And the first column is going to come from the x terms, the coefficients on the x's. The second column is going to come from the y terms, the coefficients on the y's. And the third column is going to come from the z terms, the coefficients on the z's. And then the last column over here is going to be the numbers, the constant terms on the other side of the equal sign. So for the first equation, the numbers we put in are 1, one, one, and then two million. For the second equation, that gives us the second row of the matrix, and so the numbers we put in there are 0 0.07, 0 0.085, 0 0.095, and 169750. And for the third equation, the numbers we put in are zero, there is no, no x, so the coefficient on x in that equation is zero. And then one, because it's one times y. And then negative four, because it's negative four for the coefficient on z. And then zero for the constant term. So do you see how this system of equations gives us this augmented matrix? So if you know how to take a system of equations and do what we just did, write the augmented matrix, that is the first step in the process that we're going to learn about in this chapter. The name of this process is the Gauss-Jordan method, otherwise known as Gauss-Jordan elimination, named after two mathematicians, Gauss and Jordan. And it's a three-step process, a three-part method. 
Part one is what we just did. Write the augmented matrix for the system. You take the system of equations, you leave out the plus signs and the letters for the variables and the equal signs, and just write the numbers in a matrix. So that's part one. Part two is to transform that matrix into what's called reduced row echelon form. And that's going to take some doing. So I'm going to explain how that works in more detail in a little while here. But that's the, the hardest of the three steps, the part that involves a lot of work, although your calculator might be able to do all of that part for you. And then step three is to look at the result of that and from it write down what the solution to your system is. So next, I'm going to talk more about what reduced row echelon form is. What does that mean for a matrix to be in reduced row echelon form? Well, it means that it satisfies the following four conditions. Number one, well, before I tell you what the conditions are, let me show you an example of a matrix that is in reduced row echelon form. Here you see one example of a matrix that is in reduced row echelon form. 1, 0, 5, 0, 1, negative 2. Now let me point out that this would be the matrix corresponding to the system of equations 1x plus 0y equals 5 and 0x plus 1y equals negative 2, which is really just x equals 5 and y equals negative 2. So if we had this, we would see right away that we were dealing with a system of equations whose solution is 5, negative 2. So that's the nice thing about reduced row echelon form is it lets you see right away what the solution to a system is, what the x and the y and the z, if there is one, have to be equal to. So what makes this reduced row echelon form is that it has to satisfy four conditions. Number one, if there are any rows of all zeros, they have to be at the bottom, not above a non-zero row. This particular matrix doesn't have any rows that are all zeros, so we don't have to worry about that. But if there are any rows that are just all zeros all the way across, they have to be below all the other rows of the matrix. Condition number two, the first non-zero entry of each row has to be a one, and we call that the leading one of that row. So notice in this matrix, the first row starts with a one, and the second row starts with a zero, but the first thing in that row that isn't a zero is a one. Condition number three, the leading row, of, the leading one of each row must be to the right of the leading ones in the rows above. So as you go down from one row to the next, those leading ones get further over to the right. And condition number four, all entries above and below the leading ones must be zeros. So once you find the leading one of a row, everything in that same column, everything else has to be a zero. Now, there is something called row echelon form as opposed to reduced row echelon form. Row echelon form is where only the entries below a leading one have to be zeros. So if we had like something here in this position that wasn't a zero, then this would no longer be in reduced row echelon form, but it would still be in row echelon form. We won't work with row echelon form, but the book does talk about it some, and that is an alternative method to just get to row echelon form. So I'm going to stop this video here, and we'll come back and look at some examples in part two.